Okay, so now once we know the theory, we have to actually make this in Vivado. So we can just do the steps we followed before, create project. Set the project name. And then choose the location for the project. Do you know we need to specify sources, so we click on that. We need to add an actual top file, so we can just do top wrapper. And then because we're not actually testing this on any board, we can leave it as a default part. Or in that case, you could have also chosen the basis keyboard. We're just going to click OK, and we're going to edit this later on. OK, so now since we have our Vivado loaded, we can just open up the IP catalog and search for the FFT IP. You can read a lot more about the FFT IP description here. Uh, we can have maximum up to 12 channels, and the transform length can also be up to maximum of uh, 65536. Uh, six. So in this case, we only want to do a 16 point of 50, so we just choose transform length of 16. We can leave the actual clock frequency uh, as it is default and then go to the implementation. Here we want to choose floating point. That's what we're trying to implement in this lab. All of these are grayed out. We can't edit this. And then here we want to add a reset signal. Once we added the reset signal, we also need to choose the ordering. So we want to choose natural order. So we don't have to do additional computation to do bit reversing. And it says here that the reset signal must be minimum for two clock cycles. I will show you how to manage this in the test bench. And the detailed implementation, we do not touch, but you can see how it is. You can change the name of the FFT, just, we just call this FFT. And in the implementation details, we can look how to actually send our data. So this is pretty much a summary of what we've done. We have a 16 point FFT, where the output data will be 32. So this 32 would essentially be 32 real bits and 32 imaginary bits, which totals up to 64. Why is that the case? Because we can see from the AXI stream port structure that we have, we have uh, multiple channels. So each transaction here would be, so transaction one to transaction, to transaction zero to transaction 15. That's the total six transactions that we have. We can see that the, input actually needs to be 32 for the real part and 32 bits for the imaginary part and vice versa. You can see that is constant for all the transactions that we have to do. So that's one port, that's the data port. Next port that we have to check out is this config port. So config port here only uh, needs one bit for inverse and about four bits for the scale schedule. In this case, because scaling has already been uh, covered by the FFT itself, we do not need to worry about the scaling schedule. And the output, which is the final T data that's here, this also is similar to the input data, where the top 32 is actually imaginary and the bottom 32 is real. Since our uh, floating, since the operation that we are doing is only for a sinusoid, all the data in that case is only real data that we're trying to perform. So we would be zeroing out the imaginary part. And then here we can see that the latency is about 0.552 microseconds, which is pretty fast. Next, we can just generate this for the time being, since it's not being performed in any board, we can just skip this operation. And once that's done, we have to open up the top wrapper. Okay, so now, once we have the top wrapper open, we I'll just go through the actual ports that we have. So from the sources and the IP sources, we can take the instantiation template for the FFT. You can just copy that here and paste this into your top wrapper. You can make sure to name it whatever you want it to. And then here we can see the actual ports that we have. So we have clocks, resets, and then you have your first AXI stream interface, that is your config data. The next AXI stream interface is your streaming in data. So here we can see that the input wire, which is six, 64 bits wide. And like I said before, the top 32 would be imaginary and we're zeroing that out. You have a valid signal that I showed, told, 
told everyone about in the theory part where once this data has been assigned a value, we can send the valid signal to be one. The ready signal is something that the F50 generates. So once it is ready to actually uh, take in the data, and then the last signal is something that I will talk more about when we go to the uh, test bench. So this is the master part, which is essentially the out F50. This is the output that we want. So in this, we have again, 63 bits of data in which the top 32 is imaginary and we'll be zeroing that out. And the valid that will be generated from the F50 itself. So you can see these are output ports. The only port that we need to provide is input. That is the master is ready to uh, take in the data. So I will talk more about this once we go to the test bench part. And this is the final last signal. That is the F50 itself has generated all the output that is needed. These are event sequences that are used to debug and figure out what process the F50 is actually in, whether the uh, operation has started or what operation is actually missing. And then here we can see that the port that we have selected to choose. So here we have an input clock and reset, the AXI stream interface for the data, AXI stream interface for the config, and the output data interface, which is again AXI stream. These are all outputs, and we have to provide an input for the test bench. So if you go line by line here, we have to set in data F50. Data F50 is a 64-bit data that's going to be passed to the F50 IP itself. We're assigning the top 32 of the data F50 to be zero. So we just put decimal zero here, which is 32 bits. And then we're assigning the bottom 32 in data, which is coming in from the uh, interface itself. Then we have an out F50, which, takes connect, which is connected to the F50 IP itself. This takes a 64-bit data. And finally, assigns out data, which is the one that we'll be seeing in the test bench. And we take only the bottom 32 signals from that. So that is all about the top wrapper. Next, we will move on to the test bench. So here we have the test bench itself. So we have a module. We just called it TBF50. And then again, for all the in inputs that we have, we're just making them register data types. So if you want to compare, we can compare it this way. So that all the inputs that we had here are now all registers and the outputs are all wired. The width itself is the same that we have to keep. We have to keep that in consideration. We can also verify the width from the instantiation template that we picked up. So next part is the input data. This input data is basically a ROM because it is only read only. And we have this input data, which is of length 16. So there'll be 16 vectors in this and each vector would be about uh, 32 bits wide because we only take we're only considering the real part. We have an integer i that is used for sending the data. We will see that later in the short file. And then we have the actual wrapper for the top module. So we're connecting our clocks, our resets, the in data sequence, the out data stream, and then the actual out data here. We have a clock that is just uh, for a 10 unit period. And then here we have a first initial block. We're just initializing all the values to be zero. As our reset is active low, for a value of zero, the reset would be activated, which is what we want. And in the beginning, I had said that I'll show how do we manage to keep the reset for two cycles or more. So here we can see that is done by line 88, where once we have about 70 seconds after the initial, uh, if initially the test bench has started, 70 cycles gives us 70 units of delay, which covers more than enough of the two cycles that we needed. So once that is done, we can just put reset as one. And then here we have our invalid as zero and the data itself is zero because we're not passing anything. And then the last itself is also zero. Our output ready is one because we need to tell the F50 that the outputs can be generated whenever they are ready and failure to do so results in back pressure. Back pressure is a concept where until and unless the F50 IP itself knows that the data can be sent to another IP, which is the master data sequence, the F50 will not input any data. So that is an issue that we have here. In this test bench, you can see that to the input of the F50, the test bench is actually the uh, master, while in the output part to the test bench is actually the slave and the F50 IP's output port is actually the master. 
The next part that we have to consider is this uh, config data. Config data is again just eight bits. So we just put that eight bit zero and we put the value also to be zero because we haven't actually initialized anything. Okay, so our next initial block here is after 70 seconds of delay, we've put the reset to one so that the IP is no longer in the reset stage. Then we're initializing all of the data. So here we have to initialize with 32 bits of uh, data here, which is again, all of them are in floating point. So the way we did this entire conversion is using this online calculator. So once we input any specific number, you can see that it actually stores the number and it gives the binary representation, which is in 32 bits. You can either choose 32 bit representation or you can choose hexadecimal uh, representation, either one works. So I chose 32 bit representation and the way we got the number specifically is using the uh, FFT Python code that we had written. So all of this was then passed to the uh, program here and then each binary representation was taken and it was put into the FFT here. So the input data is then being stored this way. You can choose any sequence of signals that you want to find the input for, and then you can uh, use just a bit of Python coding and just calculate the output, pass that to the actual sequence here, and then uh, initialize what position each value needs to take. Our next initial block here, which is for the config signal. So the config signal after about a hundred delays, delay units, because here we have 70. So we need to give a bit more delays. You can see an, about a hundred delay later. We're actually putting the data to be one. Why one is because one would represent the forward four year part instead of the inverse part. So once that is there after about half a cycle, we can see that the valid test is also one. That is what we learned in theory. And then we're waiting for the FFT to generate a ready signal of one so that it is actually ready to accept the data. So while the FFT isn't, while the FFT isn't ready to accept data, we can see that the config has to be one. Once the FFT accepts the data, five units after that, we can see that the valid itself, which is the data here, has to go back to low. Similarly for the second block here, so we have to give hundred units of delay and then we can use this for loop to loop over all of the, uh, all of the actual parts in the ROM that we have created. So we start from 15 and go back down to zero is because that is the manner in which the FFT actually stores the data when we have submitted it. So we give about 10 seconds of delay between each transaction and then we're checking if it's zero. If zero would indicate that this is the last data that needs to be sent. And if that is the case, we just give that the in last signal here is one. So anytime a last signal generated in an AXI stream interface, we have to physically allot a last signal for whenever the last signal is being generated in this case. And then similarly here in data would just be in data and input data and the corresponding index that we have decided from the uh, IP. And the indexes here would be corresponding to the indexes that we have specified here. And then once each index, once in data has been filled with some amount of data, some amount of data from input data, we can just say that the invalid is actually one. And this would put the, this would set up our stage for the handshake to take place. So then this is the actual part where handshake will be taking place. So we're waiting for the FFT to make its ready signal one. So we can actually accept the data. Once the FFT has set its ready signal to one, uh, we can then go to this con uh, part of the code. But until that happens, we have to keep on making invalid ones. So essentially we're waiting for the AXI transaction handshake to take place. And once the handshake takes place, we can just put both the last signals and the valid signal back down to zero. So this is completely to, so once all the transactions have been completed, we can do this. And then the final part is our output block. See the output block here, again, after giving about a hundred seconds of delay, we're waiting for the out valid in this case to be uh, high. So once the out valid in this case becomes high, because as we remember out valid was something that the uh, FFT IP itself was creating. So once the data has been generated, it's out valid will also be generated. So we're waiting for that out valid and giving about 300 units of delay so that all the data can be on the data bus. And we can see all of that in our simulation. So once all of that is done, then we can finally set the uh, out ready to be back down to zero because we no longer are ready to accept any data. That was all for the uh, code itself.
And for the final part of the lab, we need to run the simulation. So we can run the simulation. As in this case, we are doing with AXI stream protocols. The simulation would take time. Uh, so don't worry about that. So once the simulation has completed, uh, we will cut the video to that point. Now that the waveform has been generated, we can look more closely into what being shown. So once we fit this back into the view, we can see that our input data is now filled with the data that we have sent. Uh, if you want to, you can change the radix, obviously, and check if the data is matching. And then here you can see that transactions were taking place. So in the invalid part, so once all the data has been set high to valid, and then the ready itself also was set high at this point in time. So you can see that transactions were taking place at every positive edge of the clock. And that means that at every positive edge, we were actually sending some amount of data to the FFT IP. This took place for quite some time until the last signal was generated here. So here we can see that once this last signal is generated, this is the last signal that we had here. I, the final signal was generated and then we sent our last signal, which is for this uh, exact data. So then after some time, it took some time for the FFT to actually compute the data. And here we can see that the output is actually not present. We have no physical outputs here. We need a reason for that being is that we need to actually run the simulation for a bit more time. So if you see, we just run, run this for a bit more time and then again, fit a frame back. You can see that the output is actually now generated. You might need to do this for some time depending on your setting. So here, if you can just zoom in at this point in time, you will notice that the FFT, the out data has now some values. So we can always verify this using our Python code that we had previously. Uh, so you can just check that the values itself were same. And we can show the transactions here. So the ready signal, so the out ready was ready at the beginning, because that's what we said. We always said that the data, whenever it is being generated, we always are ready to accept anything that, we, uh, that the FFT itself generates. So if you just zoom back into the portion, which is here. Here we can see that the data valid, out valid is generated at this point in time. So at every clock edge now, we will be doing some sort of uh, handshaking and transaction will take place. So at this clock edge, some transaction took place and at this clock edge, some transaction took place. So this way we can see that the out data and how its transactions are taking place. And once all the out ready signals are then being generated, which is about 16 transactions which have taken place, at the 16th bit, we see our last signal be generated finally, which lasts for about one cycle. And then it becomes back down to zero. And then the output itself is zero. So that concludes this lab. You can see that uh, there is so much potential that we can do with an FFT IP and how this would be used in several uh, applications in the real world.